Hello and welcome to section one, episode 20 of the LUFC Fan Zone podcast. I'm Sam Isles. And I'm Jack Ellis. In each episode, we'll be talking to an ex-Leeds United player or manager about their time at the club. All of our episodes can be found on our LUFC Fan Zone YouTube channel, as well as Spotify and Apple Podcast. And last episode, we were with football agent Helu Rodriguez, who manages Leeds' new signing, Diego Lorente, to discuss what impact football agents have on modern day football and how Diego's move to Leeds planned out. However, this week we're back with a former player and a defender who represented both Leeds and England between 1998 and 2003. After joining Leeds from his hometown side Middlesbrough, aged just 14, he went on to feature over 100 times for the club in the Premier League as well as play a vital role in many memorable European matches. He became one of Leeds' prized assets in the early 2000s and when the club began to struggle financially off the pitch in 2003, he was one of the first big-name players to leave Ellen Road, something which aggravated both the Leeds United fans and the manager at the time, Terry Venables. That's right. This week, we're with former Leeds United defender, Jonathan Woodgate. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. No problem, lads. You OK? Good, Not fan. too bad, thank you. In mid-lockdown? Yeah, I know. It's a bit different, isn't it? <laughs> That's where you've got homeschooling. Yeah. And just before we start talking about your time at Leeds, many of our listeners will know, of course, your most recent role in football was back at Middlesbrough your, as their first team manager for last season, something which we'll talk about towards the end of the show. But since your departure in June, have you been involved with any coaching at all or have you been spending most of that time with your family? Well, I've been spending all the time with my family, really. I've had um, six months off, but to spend quality time with your your two kids and your wife's it's brilliant to be honest with you. Um but now you want to start getting back in. Um and getting in, in amongst the nitty gritty of, of management again or, or coaching whatever it is. But like I say, I've thoroughly enjoyed to spend time with family because I was in the game been in the game like twenty twenty three years now. And I've never really had that that break. The most I've been out of work is three weeks when I retired. So I've never had that that quality amount of time I spend with my family and it's something that I've really cherished and really enjoyed. And obviously during that time there's been COVID and everything which has made 2020 quite a hectic year but do you have any plans to return to coaching and maybe even management soon? Well I'd, yeah, I'd like to but you've got to wait for the right opportunity. Uh, if it's going as a manager or an assistant to someone then not a problem at all. Um, I'm a young coach who, who still wants to learn and still wants to cut, to cut his teeth in the business. Um, like I said, it's got to be the right opportunity, um, but something that I, I, I strive to do in the future. There was obviously a lot of positivity when you were appointed as a manager of Middlesbrough back in 2017 because you were returning to your boyhood club, a side which you played for when you were a kid before you turned professional. But in 1996, when you were just 16 years old, you made the switch from Middlesbrough to Leeds after being within the Middlesbrough Academy. But what can you remember about that move? And was it something you initially wanted to do, given that you were moving away from your local team? I'd say it was slightly earlier than that. I was, was, I was 14 years old when I signed for Leeds in schoolboy forms. Um, but there was always scouts coming to watch our games because we played for a successful team in Middlesbrough called Martin, really renowned team around the area in, and probably in the northeast. And you always had scouts coming to watch you. In particular, Leeds were coming to watch us quite often because we had a good team. And it was Andy Beagle and Eddie Beagle who were the youth development officers at the time. Um, so they spoke to my father, said, does, does he want to come down uh, for a trial and, and, and say how he likes it? Went down for a trial. I was like training with Middlesbrough at the time. Went down for a trial and, and, and didn't look back. Absolutely loved it. Loved how, how we were getting threat. Loved how we were learning. And it was just something that I thought was the, the best thing for me to do. Um, getting away from Middlesbrough was no no problem at all. If you If you want to succeed and be ambitious, sometimes you've got to do that. You've got to do the hard yards at the start of your career, move away from home. And and that's what I did. But it's something that I absolutely loved. I think my first time down was when I, I came down, I stayed at Beeston in some digs uh, up, up Beeston Hill. And I remember ringing my dad up and saying, Dad, uh, I'm staying at digs in Beeston. He's like, whoa, son. He was, he was right. I didn't have a clue what, what I was doing, do you know what I mean? And then we used to walk to train every day. Uh, it, was just, it was just fantastic memories in that time. And when were you first aware that Leeds were wanting to sign you? And what was the main factor about 
you wanting to move from Borough to Leeds? It was just the love of the club, really. You know, we how we got tripped by the 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 the, uh, the coaches at the time. I think Tess Pod was there as well as one of the the youth coaches when I was there. It was just how how we got threatened. How would I just describe it? Really, it was just something that I loved about the club, which stuck out. There was a, a family feeling to it, and a feeling like Leeds were a proper club as well. They were they were a really really big club. I think they'd won the championship the year before. Um, and my sister actually moved to Leeds when when she was young as well. Worked in near the um, just above the bus station, just above the train station in the big office there. So we used to go down and, and visit Leeds and go around the shopping centre and stuff and eat in, in, in different restaurants and stuff. So I just thought to myself, this is the this is the place I want to be. So I didn't have no qualms in in signing a the contract there when I was a when I was a schoolboy. And when you arrived at Ellen Road, you joined an extremely talented youth squad with Paul Robinson, Harry Kuhl and Stephen McPhail, to name just a few, all within your age bracket and looking to break into the first team squad at a similar time to you. And although Yourself and those that I just mentioned hadn't broken into the first team within the first couple of years. In 1997, under youth manager Paul Hart, you won the FA Youth Cup with that fantastic side. What can you remember about that Youth Cup win over Crystal Palace? And when did you realise that a large percentage of that team was ready to take the step up into the first team, which is what happened the next year? Well, well, firstly, first and foremost, we had... Three unbelievable coaches, really, in that age group of Paul Hart, Eddie Gray, and Robin Ray, who weren't just good coaches. They set standards for the young players to follow, and if anyone stepped out of line, we'd know straight away. So there was a lot of discipline in that team. You know, we all stayed in the digs at Thorp Arch, just over the road from the prison, um, and we all built this bond up, this bond up together. And eventually, we we started. We won the league that year. We had, a, we had a really good team, you know. Then we got to the Youth Cup final against Crystal Palace. I mean, that was that was unbelievable. I think the first leg was at Ellen Road. Second leg was was down at Crystal Palace, Sellers Park, and it was just a, it was a great experience because you think when you win the FA Youth Cup back in the day, not now, you've got a chance of getting the first team. And we knew what type of caliber players we had in had in that team. Like myself, Alan Maybury, Damian Lynch. Wesley Boyle, Paul Robinson, Lee Matthews, Harry Kewell. You know, we had a really, really good team there. Stephen McFay was the, the best player by a mile in our youth. He was absolutely, he was outstanding. Um, but we were mates as well. So that's what made it even better. You're winning things with your mates. And that was, was a fantastic achievement for us at that point as well. But like I say, the coaching um, really, really helped us. And of course, despite the size quality, that team was, of course, still very young because every player was under the age of 18. And in that year, 1997, Leeds had some incredible players in the first team and experienced ones at that, especially in your position in defence with Lucas Radaby, Gary Kelly and Tony DeRigo all within the first team squad. How were they with you when you were up and coming and breaking into the first team? And did anyone specific take you under their wing and help you out? Look. They were they were really good to be honest with you. I think they liked it as well because it's young, fresh, you know, these these kids who are just coming on the scene who have no fear. And that's what we had. But like the likes of uh, Kells and Lucas Radaby with us were absolutely first class. I mean, Lucas is a leader, but a leader with his actions more than his voice. But he's always put her arm around you. Gary Kelly was always joking and jovial and, and, and make you feel at home. And you know, you, I got on with these players like a house on fire, really, and we all become a really, really tight-knit group from going to the youth team to the first team. Because you've got to think as well, Gary Kelly must have been about, he'd have been about 23, 24 when we just started getting in the first team. So he was only young as well. Okay, a seasoned player, seasoned at the national. But he had the same mentality as, as the same as us, really. And although you signed your professional deal in May 1997, I presume you were already trained with the first team prior to that. And can you remember your first ever training session with the first team? And what was that like? Because it must have been a bit of a jump up training with a youth squad and defending against someone like Rod Wallace or Tony Aboa or maybe even Ian Rush, who was at Leeds at the time. It was a big step up, but it's something that you've got to make. I, I remember when it was George Graham and we used to play against the first team all the time, 11 v 11s. And we used to go up, I think we can, we can try and beat these. We had that mentality as us a youth team because Paul Art and Eddie Gray instilled in us. Listen, you can go over there and beat them. Don't be sitting back 
and not tackling and letting them do what they want. We'd go in there, and we'd be like flat out with them, like full force, trying to trying to get in the team. Basically, that's what you that's what you want to do. And we had that mentality to try and get in there. But when you went to train with the first team, you had to perform because if you didn't, you knew you knew you wouldn't get another chance. And you know the likes of George Graham, who's a it was an, a, an unbelievable manager at Arsenal. You know, you knew that he liked his defenders, and he liked his defenders to be aggressive. So when I was going in there, like you say, against Jimmy or Rod Wallace or I remember Clyde Vinar as well, I would be like right at him, and I'd be giving me bits back and elbow me and standing on my feet and that. But that's part of the thing that makes you a player, and you, and you grow up in them sessions. But the sessions that we used to love, we used to really love it, and I think Paul Art and Eddie Gray liked it more than us because sometimes we were beaten. <laughs> and then from your first training session to your professional debut which was October 1998 when you made your first Legion United first team appearance away at Nottingham Forest in the Premier League under new manager David O'Leary who was appointed in that same month what can you remember about your debut and when did you realise that you'd be starting that match? Well I, I thought I was going to get my debut when George Graham was there I thought he was going to put me in um, he didn't he left. David O'Leary came straight in and put me in. He said, "This was his, this what he said to me. He said, you're playing on Saturday. Tell your mum and dad to come. Honestly, I think I went white. He used to call me Ghost anyway. Or Paul Hart, he used to call me Ghost. I went, I was like Asper. Obviously, shit in my pants. I can swear on here, can't I? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, and I remember I was room with Paul Robinson the night before the game. And he went to me, he went, oh, tell you what, Neil Shipley in the morning for you, haven't you? I went on. He was a big, he was a big player. One, he's shipping. He was a big unit, good player. He played all around the country, and all. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was a bag for the game. And you know what? As soon as you walk on that pitch, I was just no nerves. This is where I'm meant to be. This is where I'm meant to play. So I go from absolutely shitting it to this is me. This is where I belong. And then as soon as I got on the pitch, no nerves. Played the football. Played right centre half of the three. I had my blonde spiky hair. Yeah. And do you know why? I'd love to go back at that moment, that would be honest with you. And all the Leeds fans were there at the city ground. It was just a fantastic moment for me and my family, really. The first game of that 1998 season was away to Middlesbrough just one month before that Forest match. Were you ever close to getting a call before that game? Because that would have been a great game to make your debut in. Yeah, but George Graham was the manager at the time and they had a lot of good good centre backs and I'd, um, I didn't want to take the risk but David O'Leary young manager had no fear and put us in and it, it, it takes a lot of uh, courage to put a young defender in especially at that age we obviously knew what knew what I could do he'd see me play he'd see me play in the reserves so it was a no brainer for him I think In your first season as a pro at Leeds you made 33 first team appearances with 25 of them coming in the Premier League which was amazing for the age that you had that you're at even. Did you expect to feature that much in your debut season, especially with Leeds having some experienced players in the defence like we mentioned before? Yeah, I think yeah, I did, yeah, because I knew if I played well, then I'd keep, keep my um, position in the team. And I knew the style of football David really wanted to play, then I knew I had a chance. But also I knew that if I didn't do it every day in training and every, in, in, in every game, then I wouldn't. It's unusual these days for an 18-year-old to be playing in the Premier League and play that many games in his, in his first season as 18-year-old. These days, the kids don't get chances. Like I said, Dave Lee was brave and he gave me an opportunity. But when you get the opportunity, you have to take it. And that's what I did. As well as them 25 Premier League appearances in your debut season, you also scored two goals with the first coming at Ellen Road and the winner against Sheffield Wednesday in a 2-1 win. What can you remember about that goal and how did it feel to score your first goal at Ellen Road as well? Yeah, well, I, I scored in the second half, I think I'm right. I remember in the first half, um, we went in at half-time and Dave O'Leary absolutely annihilated me. And I think Weather, I think David Weatherall did as well because I wasn't winning any headers against um, Booth, the big centre-forward. It was a Chef Wed, he's a Huddersfield lad, but at Chef Wed. Wasn't winning the header, getting bullied left, right and centre. They absolutely went through me. So second half, I come out. I thought to myself, right, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. So end up winning all my headers, being aggressive again. Ball comes in from a corner, and there's me back post, nodded it back. I was really. I don't even think I was going for goal. I was just nodding it back, and it went in the goal. But again, 
that feeling of Ellen Road going absolutely mental. We won the game 2-1. That feeling of Ellen Road going absolutely bonkers is the thing that will never leave me because the atmosphere you're there in games when you were winning or when you were getting goals is, uh, is second to none, really. <laughs> in your debut season, Leeds finished fourth in the Premier League and lost just two home games all year and qualified for the UEFA Cup for the following season. Yeah. What did you make of that first campaign as a whole? As it was a slight improvement on the previous year when Leeds finished fifth under George Graham. Well, we made Ellen Road a, a fortress, really. And I think with, with the young, energetic team that we had, I think all the fans were buying in. I think the fans must have been loving it because you've got all these kids, 18, 19-year-old, 20, 23 or whatever, and then you've got a few senior pros. And they're just absolutely running riots. I used to go into games thinking, whoever we were playing, we'll win this. Or we go one down, we'll win 4-1. That's the type of mentality we had in the team at the time. And that's the type of football we try to play. We try to be really aggressive. And that's what, that's what got us there in the end, being aggressive and scoring as many goals as we could. And as well as your impressive performances for Leeds, after just one year of senior professional football, you made your professional debut for England in 1999 against Bulgaria in Sofia, starting alongside Saul Campbell. How did you find out that you'd be getting that opportunity for your first international cup and what was that whole experience like? Well, Kevin Keegan had tried to get me in a squad, I think it was against Hungary. Um, but I was I was out or something or I was ill or injured or something. So he couldn't get me in. And then a time before that, he had me and Stephen Gerrard training with England. And me and Stephen made a bit of a like a good impression with him and we, we trained really well and so he wanted us to get in the squad. Uh, and I remember my my dad getting a phone call, and he was a plumber at the time. Um, and he and I had, he didn't have more bars than them, but my dad did because he was a plumber. So the, 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 Kevin Keegan's rang my dad, and he's in a loft somewhere in Middlesbrough. And um, <laughs> he told me the story. He said, "John, I had, so I had this call off Kevin Keegan's son, and I didn't think it was him, so I just told him to piss off." It is Kevin Keegan. Um, I want your son to be in the uh, in the next two European qualifiers for England in the summer. And my dad was like, oh, my God. So he told me this story. He said, listen, son, they want you in the England squad. I said, well, bloody hell, Dad. I said, get me there. So, again, my dad telling me that story now was, uh, was brilliant. Think back memories for myself, to be honest with you. So they rang your dad instead of straight to you? <laughs> yeah, we, did, we didn't have mobiles, did we? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And he was a plumber, so he needed a mobile. Hi. Yeah. So they rang him, go, and then Kevin Keegan told me I was playing the day before um, against Bulgaria. I just dodged off in the team, and it was a European qualifier, so it wasn't a wasn't a, like um, a gimme game. It was a big game. I just thought to myself, go out there and do what you do. And again, shitting myself before the game. As soon as we get on the pitch, I just had this thing of it's just it's just like home. You're on that pitch across that white line. It's your home and you know exactly what you're doing. So that was, uh, that was the type of feeling I was getting. But like I say, I'm nervous. I'm really nervous. The following season was David O'Leary's first full season in charge. And before the season had even started, he was very active in the transfer market, spending just short of £20 million before the season has even begun, which included the arrival of both Danny Mills and Michael Dewberry who both, of course, were defenders. And although your shirt number had changed from 25 to number six, which is the classic central defender number, did you feel that the arrival of the two would have any impact on your playing time and your impressive start to the club? Yeah, well, I think I like to challenge myself and think they are come to the football club and they're going to play in front of me. Yeah, That's what I think. And I think to myself, no, they're not. I'm going to play in front of them. So I, I always treat it as a, as a challenge to me. Someone's going to come in this club and try and take opposition, basically over my dead body. It ain't going to happen. I'm going to end up playing. It's going to be me and Lucas at the back and, and, and no one else. So I always see that as a challenge, mate. And I like the challenge. Every time, I'm sure you're going to win the ball Rio and win the ball Don Matteo. I think myself, no, I want to be the number one. I want to be the number one. No one's going to get my shirt. That's how, you, that's how you've got to think as a player. You've got to see it as a challenge. You don't think that you want to get replaced. You think, this is a challenge here and I want it. No, absolutely. Because of the huge amount of money spent that season with Olivier Decor also arriving later in the year as the new club's record signing, 
Did you and the other Leeds players feel it was a target to win the league that year, or was it an unrealistic feat given the competition at the top of the Premier League that season? Yeah, I think I think it had been tough to try and win the Premier League that season. I think we were more aiming for Champions League qualification, which we thought was a realistic ambition for us in the football club. Don't get me wrong, we were in amongst one and two most of that season. One, two, three maybe. Um, but we didn't quite get there. But I'm sure we got the Champions League football that season. Yeah. So that again, that was a milestone for the football club. It was a milestone for David O'Leary and what he'd done and how the club invested in players. Because we did have a good squad at that time. And although Leeds lost to both Manchester United and Liverpool within the first month of the season. After a 2-1 home loss to Liverpool, Leeds went on to win 12 of their next 14 league matches, winning 10 matches in a row at Ellen Road in all competitions within a four-month run, and sat pretty top of the Premier League throughout the whole of December. How did that run boost your hopes of winning the league? And what do you think changed in them four months? Because Leeds seemed unbeatable at Ellen Road at that point. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the game where we where the ten un the ten unbeaten came the ten wins on the spin came to an end. It was a four four draw, Everton away and I scored. And I brought the I brought someone down to make it four four and the score from the free kick. Because Harry Peel went mad at me in the change room after the game saying, Why didn't I stay on my feet? We had a Barney after the game, I think it was. Um yeah, but we in them ten games we we thought we were in, invincible. I remember going away to Derby we won one nil. I think it was the last minute Harry Kuehl penalty. Um, and I remember the music we played after the game. I think it was uh, a Don Henley song. Is it Lost Boys or something like that? <laughs> One of the, these are, the, these are the, the moments that you remember at games. But in that time, I just thought we've got a real good chance here and a real aggressive team. No one wanted to play against us. And I think at that time we were everybody's second team because we'd be young and, and, and vibrant and playing the way the fans want to see you play. However, although Leeds were sitting top of the Premier League going into the year 2000, the side did eventually finish third and 22 points behind champions Manchester United and lost 11 games throughout that year. And as well as the results, there were a couple of off-the-field issues in the second half of the season which potentially changed the feeling around Ellen Road, especially with the fans. And... The first of which was the incident which involved you at the start of the year and resulted in the court case, which obviously we won't go into. But how much did them them events distract you from the performances on the pitch? Because at the time, you were a key player in the side, despite still only being 20 and starting almost every match. So it must have been hard to concentrate on the situation off the field, which lasted almost two years, as well as the performances on it. Yeah, I think as a young lad, you get you get distracted. And listen, we all make mistakes, and you make mistakes, and you, and you learn from these mistakes. But like I say, it wasn't a good time for the football club or myself. You know, like I say, we we all make mistakes, and you know, you try to move on from it. And it's it's lessons that you'll teach players that you coach in the future, or and in, in, in your kids. But like I say, yeah, it's not a thing that I always always try to look back on because it wasn't a good moment in my career. But like I say, you move on and you learn, you become a better person from it. And the second incident that season came in Istanbul in April when Leeds were drawn against Galatasaray in the UEFA Cup semi-final. You and the rest of the Leeds squad made the trip to Turkey for the first leg. However, on the eve of the match, two Leeds supporters, Chris Lofthouse and Kevin Spate, tragically lost their life in the Turkish capital after being killed by some Galatasaray supporters. Would you be able to talk us through your experiences in Istanbul before the match and how you found out about that horrific incident? Yeah, uh, getting there, I remember getting off the, the plane and walking through the airport and it was just rammed full of Galatasaray fans. And we're like, wow, what is this? Because they're, they're, a, they're a crazy bunch uh, and they don't really care what they do, to be honest with you. So we, we get to the hotel and we're chilling out having our evening meal and stuff. And then I remember, I think it was late on the night, I think we were, a couple of us were getting massages or whatever, and the, and the, news, the news came in that the two Leeds fans had died. We were absolutely... Absolutely devastated. We, we couldn't believe. We couldn't believe the next day when the the game was going ahead. We were like this game can't go on ahead. Our two of our fans have have come away and they've been killed. With Chris and Chris and Kevin. We just we were like astounded that that match went ahead, and no wonder we got beat. 
because we our minds had been all over the place. I remember walking out the tunnel that day and just being surrounded by police and their fans just throwing things down at us. And I, honestly, I, I couldn't believe it. And to this day, I still believe that game should never have gone ahead. In my view, if it if it if it would have gone ahead another day, we'd have won that game. We'd have won that game. Our minds would have been right, and we'd have, we'd have won for for Kevin and Chris. That's that's without a doubt. Um, but again, it's not something that that was nice to experience um, being away from home. Also, because my father was over in, over there as well, so I was obviously worried about worried about him and the other players. Um, some of the wives were over there, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice experience. And like you said, despite the trouble, you were for ordered that the match had to be played, and if it hadn't, then Galatasaray would automatically get the win, or would have repercussions on Leeds for failing to for failing to fulfil the fixtures. So. How did you and the rest of the squad take that? Because, like you said, it must have been extremely hard to focus on the match given the previous night's events. Yeah, like I say, we had we had no choice at all. We had no choice. We had to play it. Um, we just had to knuckle down and get on with it. There was no other way around it at all. We just had to get on with that game and and give it our best shot. Um, we wasn't good on the night. We lost. We lost. Was it two 0 on the night? It was two 0 on the night, wasn't it? Yeah. We just wanted to, to get out of there and, and get home after what happened over in um, Istanbul. It was an absolute tragedy, an absolute tragedy for all the fans involved and the families of, of, of Kevin and Chris. I can't imagine how they were feeling. And that brings an end to section one of episode 20. Join us next week for section two, where Jonathan speaks about Leeds' European adventure in 2001 and reaching the Champions League semi-final as well as his departure to Newcastle, which allowed Leeds to generate some much-needed funds as the club was beginning to struggle financially off the pitch. Thanks for listening.